<clears throat> okay, let's uh, let's begin um, uh, to begin the program tonight. Uh, I'd like to <clears throat> ask your indulgence to say a few words about our speaker, Chaz Freeman. We are honored by his presence, wisdom, and animating wit. Words cannot describe or do justice. We are indebtedness to Chaz for his long years of unsurpassed and unwearied labors in service of his country, his countrymen, and the Committee for the Republic. He is an irreplaceable national treasure. We intend to confer our Defender of Liberty Award on Chaz after the pandemic passes. We will postpone recitation of his endless accomplishments and awards until that time. Chaz acts from honesty and unwavering devotion to truth without ulterior motives. We may disagree on some things, but we can all agree that there will never be a second Chaz Freeman. Chaz was forced to step down last month as committee chair for health reasons, but continues to serve as emeritus and flood our inboxes with his list serve. Chaz, uh, I ask you to join me in uh, giving an ovation to Chaz. <clears throat> Stormy applause was heard in all. <laughs> now, now, now we come. I hope you can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> now we come to the anti climax uh, uh, of the program. The, the president of the Council on Farm Relations, Richard Haas, has recently recommended uh, that the U.S. Uh, replace the U.S. replace strategic ambiguity with strategic clarity, i.e., war if China uses force against. Taiwan. Haas maintains the U.S. non-Congress should take us to war. Chaz will lead a discussion of whether deaf diplomacy can avoid war with China and whether the Constitution requires the decision to be made by Congress and not the President, as both yes, parties please. have endorsed since World War II. Chaz was President at the creation when Nixon went to China yes, in 1972. Uh, he has been steeped in U.S. China relations for half a century. No one is more qualified to speak. The committee has scheduled our Taiwan Salon for January, but Chaz thought we should accelerate it to be a, to avoid being overtaken by events. I give you Chaz Freeman. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much, John. Uh, may I ask those who have not muted uh, their uh, uh, connection to do so be a uh, rocket in the back? Um, uh, I pay John a lot of money to write stuff like that, and um, it's gratifying <laughs> to get my uh, money's worth. Uh, let me uh, launch without further ado into the into the issue I want to discuss, which is possibly urgent because of the state of confusion in in the United States over the legitimacy of authority and who has authority. <clears throat> Taiwan is an established American foreign policy success story that seems to be nearing the end of its shelf life. Management of the Taiwan question has long been the key to peace or war, possibly nuclear war, between the United States and China. Now the door may be closing to peace. The essence of the Taiwan question is what political relationship should and can the two sides of the Taiwan Strait have with each other? This question is a legacy of the Chinese Civil War, the Cold War, the strategically dictated rapprochement between Washington and Beijing at the beginning of the 1970s, the U.S. habit of substituting military deterrence for diplomacy, and the American attraction to strategy-free values-based foreign policy. Given the stakes for Americans, the question of how to balance relations with Taiwan and the China mainland deserves informed judgments and adroit statecraft. But the issue's history is widely forgotten or misunderstood, and the dilemmas it presents get almost no attention. Americans seem to have achieved herd immunity to both situational awareness and strategic reasoning. The United States risks sleepwalking into a war with China it does not want and cannot now win. 
such a war would likely end U.S. primacy in East Asia. It would certainly poison prospects for great power cooperation on planet-wide problems. <coughs> Taiwan is an island a bit larger than Maryland, but with four times the inhabitants. When it was seized by Japan in 1895, it was a province of Qin China. Chiang Kai-shek's Republic of China recovered it from Japan in 1945. When Jiang lost the civil war in the rest of the country in 1949, he fled to Taiwan and moved the capital of his Chinese government from Nanjing to Taipei. When the Korean War broke out in 1950, the United States intervened militarily to prevent either Jiang or his communist rivals on the mainland from attacking each other across the Taiwan Strait. The idea was to confine conflict to the Korean Peninsula. Our intervention frustrated an imminent communist invasion of the island, but did not end the Chinese Civil War, which sputtered on both militarily and politically. Beijing still views Taiwan through the lens of this unended civil war. For two decades, the United States backed Chiang Kai-shek, championed regime change on the mainland, and insisted that Taipei, not Beijing, was both the legal capital of China and entitled to represent China internationally. That this misrepresentation of reality survived as long as it did is testimony both to U.S. prestige in the Cold War and to the skill of America's diplomats. This is something I participated in, and we did a remarkable job of making the worse appear the better cause. In 1971, the world rebelled against the absurdity of this thesis, overcoming American opposition to seat Beijing in place of Taipei as China's representative in the UN Security Council and other international organizations. In 1972, President Nixon sought to recruit Beijing as America's partner, mainland of the Soviet Union. In 1979, in furtherance of this objective, the and I think all of our allies in transferring diplomatic recognition from Taipei to Beijing. Um, I, I just was saying we, in 1979, we switched relations from Taipei to Beijing. And to make this switch, we met, we met Beijing's terms that we would draw American forces and installations from Taiwan and terminate our, our defense treaty with the island. But with the mainland's reluctant acquiescence, we retained all our other relationships with Taiwan on a low profile, unofficial basis. Beijing simultaneously set aside its loudly proclaimed determination to liberate Taiwan by force and began a sustained effort to end the division of China by peaceful means. The long-term results of this subtle set of Sino-American diplomatic bargains were truly remarkable, though as always, success bred new problems. Beijing's alignment with Washington helped to bring down the Soviet empire and system. China opened itself to America and the world. After a while, it became the greatest engine of growth in the global economy. Concerns about China's poverty and weakness were succeeded by worries about it outcompeting us at our own capitalist game. Meanwhile, the relaxation of Sino-American tensions enabled Taiwan to evolve politically and economically, becoming the freest and most prosperous Chinese society in China's long history and the only democracy ever to take root on Chinese soil. This singular success was built on a collection of diplomatic fictions. The lawyers in this audience will be familiar with the concept of a legal fiction. This is a means of preventing controversies or resolving them by, stimulate, by stipulating that something known to be factually incorrect is for at least some purposes unassailably true. An example is the adoption of a child. The law overcomes biology by making the persons adopting the child its parents for legal purposes while declaring its birth mother and father to be unrelated strangers. Just so, Diplomatic fictions can set aside problems by establishing something that is not factual as an unchallengeable stipulation or truth. This sort of finesse is, of course, not limited to the courts or diplomacy. 
It's also useful in charge social interactions. So when Teddy White, the time correspondent in wartime Chongqing, finally got the invitation to lunch he'd been seeking from Zhou and Lai, he found that Zhou had prepared a banquet featuring a suckling pig. As an Orthodox Jew, he felt he had to tell his host that his religion would not permit him to eat pork. Joe famously responded by saying, this is not a pig, it's a duck. You can eat duck, can't you? Once it was established that there was no piglet on the table, White was able both to acknowledge his host's hospitality and to enjoy the repast without undue remorse. But I digress. Uh, America's Cold War support for Chiang Kai-shek as the legitimate ruler of all of China, including, by the way, outer Mongolia, was a diplomatic fiction of great utility to the United States when we sought to isolate China's actual rulers, the communist victors in its civil war, and to buttress Jiang's control of his Taiwan bastion against them. But patriots on the mainland saw U.S. policy as a humiliating extension of past foreign frustration of the Chinese people's aspirations for national unity. From their point of view, part of China had been forcibly carved off by the U.S. 7th Fleet, incorporated into an American sphere of influence, and garrisoned by U.S. troops. Even worse, in the 1950s, American officials like John Foster Dulles openly toyed with the idea of permanently separating Taiwan from the mainland. Chiang Kai-shek blocked this and sent a secret letter to Zhou Enlai taking credit for doing so. Eventually, the diplomatic fiction that Taipei was the capital of China succumbed to the implacable realism of the international community. We needed a new framework to prevent the reignition of the Chinese Civil War. China was de facto divided between Taipei and Beijing, but both were adamant that there was, should, and could be only one China of which Taiwan was a part. In the early 1970s, this consensus was translated by American statecraft into a stipulation that there was only one China. When he visited Beijing in 1972, President Nixon solemnly declared in writing that the United States did not challenge the cross-strait consensus on this. Beijing accepted Nixon's declaration as a renunciation of any ongoing American intent to divide China by creating, and I quote, one China, one Taiwan, one China, two governments, two Chinas, an independent Taiwan, or by advocating that, quote, the status of Taiwan remains to be determined, unquote. Almost seven years later, in late 1978, a reiterated U.S. commitment to one China, this time accompanied by recognition that China's capital was in Beijing rather than in Taipei, facilitated Chinese agreement to both U.S.-China normalization and the continuation of American substantive relationships with Taiwan on an unofficial basis. The perceived American retreat from attempting to partition China made it possible for the Chinese Communist Party to turn its attention from opposing American interference in China's internal affairs to exploring how it might negotiate an accommodation with its civil war opponent, Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang, or Chinese Nationalist Party. The one China stipulation of a single Chinese sovereignty on both sides of the enabled Beijing to act as though a reunified China was inevitable, and Taipei to pretend that it either agreed with this or that it might eventually be persuaded to do so. As expected, Beijing deferred action while Taipei played for time. The fact that the United States Beijing's apprehensions that it might have to go to war to prevent such a split. The uh, perceived American retreat from attempting to partition China made it possible for the Chinese Communist Party to turn its attention from opposing American interference in China's internal affairs to exploring how it might negotiate an accommodation with its civil war opponent, Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang, or Chinese Nationalist Party. The one China uh, stipulation of a single Chinese sovereignty on both sides of the strait took the urgency out of the Taiwan issue. It enabled Beijing to act as though a reunified China was inevitable, and Taipei to pretend that it either agreed with that or might eventually be persuaded to do so. 
as expected, Beijing deferred action, while Taipei played for time. The fact that the United States officially ruled out actions to split China, using Chinese, Chinese terminology, lessened Beijing's apprehensions that it might have to go to war to prevent such a split. This, in turn, reduced the need for U.S. deterrence of a mangled attack on Taiwan. Despite a blip or two, tensions in the Taiwan Strait subsided. The diplomatic fiction of one China eventually enabled the two sides to avoid arguments about sovereignty while they facilitated cross-strait trade, travel, and other connectivity. In 2005, building on the precedent of talks before Zhang's flight to Taiwan, the chairman of both the Communist and Nationalist parties met in Beijing. They agreed on both the One China principle and a remarkable range of practical connections between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. By 2009, where Communist and Nationalist fighters had been engaged in aerial dogfights 50 years before, the airlines of the two sides were conducting 370 scheduled flights a week between cities in Taiwan and the China mainland. In 2015, Taiwan's then president, Ma ying met in Singapore with his mainland counterpart, Xi Jinping. Sadly, that meeting appears to have marked peak detente between the two sides. Over the nearly 50 years since the Nixon administration first embraced the notion of one China, it served as the essential underpinning of Sino-American peace and the absence of armed conflict in the Taiwan Strait. But it was constantly chipped away at by opponents of Sino-American normalization, advocates of Taiwanese self-determination, American single-issue activists, bureaucratic advocates of less contrived and untidy arrangements, anti-communists, and more recently, advocates of great power rivalry and confrontation with China. There is little left of the original construct it's hard to see how this foundational subterfuge can now sustain the many useful bargains built on it. I think there are at least three reasons for the withering of the crucial one China stipulation. Each is understandable, but rests on increasingly dubious presuppositions. First, most Taiwanese have now decided they do not want to associate themselves politically with the communist regime across the strait and would prefer either sustained autonomy or outright independence. The mainland has presented them with no vision of a joint future they might find attractive. Whatever appeal association with the rest of China might once have had has progressively evaporated as the mainland has become an ever more abusive police state. Like the protesters in Hong Kong, partisans of independence in Taiwan, imagine that foreign sympathy and alignment with their cause will guarantee intervention to help them realize it, despite passionate opposition from the mainland. This is quite a gamble, to say the least. Second, most Americans find aspirations for self-determination compelling and are unsure of or unaware of the risks entailed in an attempt by Taiwan to achieve it. As our own war for independence shows, peoples seldom achieve separation from a larger polity without having to fight for it. And very often their attempts fail. Ask American Southerners, the Basques, the Chechens, Biafra's Ipos, the Kurds, the Palestinians, or the Tibetans about this. The desire of Taiwan's inhabitants for self-determination should be and is no surprise. In 1895, China nonchalantly turned them over to the Japanese Empire. For 50 years, the Japanese both abused and partially assimilated them. When Jiang Kai-shek and his two million man entourage of draftees and carpetbaggers took refuge in Taiwan, they severely oppressed its residents while subjecting them to a process of re signification that was not significantly gentler than what the Uyghurs in Xinjiang are currently experiencing. Taiwan's indigenous Chinese were enlisted as frontline participants in America's containment of China and the Soviet Union before being diplomatically disavowed by the United States. The people of Taiwan built the rule of law and the democracy they now enjoy pretty much on their own, though with quiet, unacknowledged American support. They know what control by outsiders feels like, 
and they have no desire to feel it again. On the other hand, they've had many decades to pursue a strategy toward the mainland that might preserve their autonomy without American military backing. They've not done so. Instead of facing the ineluctable realities of their dilemma, they have counted on a Hollywood-style rescue from it by the naval equivalent of the U.S. cavalry. Taiwan separatists know that they can neither persuade the mainland to grant them independence nor win a, a war of secession with it. So they've convinced themselves that the United States can be relied upon to intervene to defend their defiance of one China or help them formalize its de facto partition. This belief enables them both to keep defense spending low and to shift the risks of provoking a bloody rendezvous with Chinese nationalism onto the United States. But China is a great power and in Taiwan, Beijing would be fighting in what the world, including Washington, has formally acknowledged is Chinese territory, not a third country like Korea or Vietnam. Americans might well think twice about going to war with a nuclear armed China to detach territory from it. Third, the mainland's ability to coerce Taiwan was long limited by its own military incapacities, a convincing American deterrent capability, and Taiwan's readiness to mount effective resistance to invasion and occupation. But beginning in 1995, escalating assertions of an identity separate from China by Taiwan's leaders and sympathetic endorsement of such aspirations by American politicians kicked off a major program of modernization by the People's Liberation Army, PLA, aimed at being able to conquer the island over American military opposition. The PLA, according to some military and intelligence experts, could now destroy Taiwan at will and take it, if that were possible, would take many tens of thousands of U.S. casualties. It would also require air and missile strikes on the Chinese homeland that would justify counter strikes on our homeland. If U.S. recovery of Taiwan were successful, the mainland would just bide its time, rebuild its strength, and try again. As was true of Hanoi, Beijing is a determinedly nationalist opponent that enjoys the balance of fervor in its struggle to end the American backed division of its country. To normalize relations with Beijing, successive U.S. presidents gave specific commitments in three carefully negotiated joint communiques. These documents, issued in 1972, 1979, and 1982, are the foundation of Sino-American relations. In them, the U.S. government promised that it would no longer maintain official relations with Taipei, that it would have no troops and military installations on the island, and that it would sell only carefully selected defensive weapons to Taiwan on a restrained basis. In the third communique, the United States agreed to limit the quality and reduce the quantity of its arms sales to Taiwan. Over the succeeding decades, Washington has progressively or cast aside every one of these strictures. Members of the U.S. cabinet now meet with Taiwan officials and travel to Taiwan. There they are supported by a newly constructed $250 million quasi-embassy guarded by U.S. Marines. The United States has returned to Cold War-style championing of Taipei's diplomatic relations with third countries, punishing those that switch relations to Beijing. There are reports that there are once again American military personnel in Taiwan teaching its armed forces how to conduct operations against the mainland. Taiwan has reemerged as a major purchaser of U.S. weaponry. On November 12, 2020, nine days after the U.S. presidential election made his boss a lame duck, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo completed the trashing of the one China stipulation by declaring inaccurately that, quote, Taiwan has not been part of China, unquote. In 1979, as the Taiwan Relations Act, or TRA, noted, the United States, quote, terminated governmental relations with the governing authorities on Taiwan, unquote. That is a quote from the law. The TRA was enacted to enable Americans to sustain our ties with the people of Taiwan 
without governmental relations. But it's hard to argue that in most respects, such relations have not now been restored. U.S. policy enshrined in the TRA has been to ensure that, quote, the future of Taiwan will be determined by peaceful means, unquote. But by deviating from the understandings that have been central to that objective, the United States has helped to ensure that virtually no one on the China mainland now believes that a purely, feasible, purely peaceful resolution is still feasible. The TRA declares that the United States should provide, quote, Taiwan with arms of a defensive character, unquote. But there is now no such filter applied to arms sales to the island. The TRA, which is a domestic law, not a treaty, calls on the United States to maintain the capacity to, 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 deter, to deter, quote, the resort to force or other forms of coercion to jeopardize the security of the people on Taiwan. But the United States no longer has the surefire ability to defend Taiwan against the use of force from the mainland. And the military balance in the area is increasingly disadvantageous. The credibility of US military deterrence has declined, even as Washington has, Washington has withdrawn the reassurances that once persuaded Beijing, it would not need to use force. China, Taiwan, and the United States are locked in a dance of reciprocal displays of military capability and will. The logic of the situation implies willingness to escalate from shows of force to skirmishes and thence to battle. It's been a long time since the danger of war over Taiwan has been as great as it is now. The irony is that the arrangements Washington and Beijing put in place in 1979 to preserve the peace, including the unilateral U.S. enactment of the TRA, worked far better than even their authors hoped they might. After the switch in diplomatic relations, tensions with the mainland diminished, and Taiwan's security improved. The island was able to do away with martial law and to democratize. Taiwan became one of the most prosperous societies on the planet. Its per capita GDP is lower than ours, but its median wealth of $70,191 is now greater than our 65904 The one China framework that produced these admirable results wasn't broke, but successive administrations in Taipei and Washington nonetheless fixed it. It is now out of order. By progressively going back on its word, Washington has established a reputation in China for faithlessness that precludes anyone there trusting further American commitments. Pro forma protests that the United States stands by the, stands by the three joint communiques fool no one but amnesiac Americans. The resulting distrust precludes new Sino-American understandings about how to manage differences over Taiwan. But without such understandings, the escalating contradictions between Chinese nationalism and Taiwanese identity politics are taking us toward conflict. All three parties, Beijing, Taipei, and Washington, are nearing the point at which we can no longer avoid very unwelcome choices. Beijing now sees no credible prospect that the issue of Taiwan's relationship with the mainland can be resolved by peaceful means without at least some element of military coercion or possibly a war. The military balance in the Taiwan Strait increasingly favors the PLA. That deters U.S. intervention. Even so, the Chinese leadership faces a hard choice between using force and abandoning the century-old dream of the United China free of foreign spheres of influence. In making its decision, Beijing must weigh the risks of a costly war with the United States that could draw in Japan and escalate to the nuclear level. Weigh that against the domestic political consequences of accepting humiliation on the core issue of Chinese nationalism. As long as the people of Taiwan continue to believe that they have a blank check from the United States that they can fill out in American blood, they will feel free to temporize. Removing ambiguity from the U.S. commitment would just encourage them to push the envelope even more than they already have. Meanwhile, whatever they do, military balance in the area will continue to shift against them. So Taipei must decide 
whether to seek a negotiated accommodation with the Chinese to cross the strait, or risk a war with them that even with American backing would destroy the island's democracy and prosperity without gaining independence for it. By opting for exclusive reliance on military deterrence unaccompanied by diplomacy to encourage cross-strait detente, rapprochement, and accommodation, the United States has delegated the choice between peace and war to Beijing and Taipei. It has never been clear whether Washington has been bluffing or serious about going to war with China over Taiwan. Confronted with a choice between a potentially ruinous face-off with China and standing aside as the democratic antagonist of our now officially designated Chinese adversary goes down, what would the United States do? To declare that we would go to war would encourage risk-taking by Taipei. To say that we would not go to war would encourage adventurism by Beijing. So there is no advantage to dispelling the current ambiguity. But surely we must base our management of the Taiwan issue on a considered judgment about what we are and are not prepared to do to reduce the danger of war over it, even if we keep this judgment to ourselves. A shifting balance of power, stiff-necked nationalism in Beijing, delusions of immunity from harm in Taipei, and a strange mixture of bravado and inattention in Washington provide all the ingredients for a tragedy. I see no easy answers for any of the participants that can halt their march toward catastrophe. I do have a few thoughts about what this drama means for us and what we might do to avoid a completely calamitous ending to it for all sides. But I'd prefer to hear answers from those of you who have so patiently listened to me. I ask only that before you advocate an action, you ask yourselves, as diplomats and military professionals, professionals are taught to do, and then what? The other side gets a vote. So uh, I've now concluded my remarks, and I hope we can, I hope you can instruct me on what ought to be done. <laughs> Chaz, uh, before uh, we do that, can you tell us why you uh, felt we ought to accelerate the, uh, we'd schedule this for January? What, what, um, what could events could uh, <clears throat> make this more timely than we, we than we want it to be? Uh, well, this is an opportunity to clarify a key point. That is, we're probably not in the short term talking about um, any attempt by the mainland to deliver a knockout blow to Taiwan. Instead, we're talking about a sucker punch. Uh, and all the conditions for that are falling into place. On the one hand, the United States is in the worst state of disorder uh, in terms of policy formulation that it probably has ever been. Um, our guard is down. Nobody knows who's in charge. And uh, this is a moment um, of, uh, of opportunity if you are, if you believe that uh, these kinds of uh, conditions uh, provide opportunities. On the other hand, um, the Chinese have undoubtedly been thinking about uh, somewhere that they could deliver a blow to Taiwan that would be below the threshold that provokes an American intervention, but would be sufficient to attack the center of gravity as they see it in Taiwan, namely Taiwan's psychological resistance. Um, they want to convince Taipei that reunification is inevitable, uh, that it must negotiate or face military consequences it cannot survive. They want to convince the United States that we should not lightly risk war with them make us think about the possibility of a nuclear exchange or uh, something else in the Taiwan region. Those are their objectives. And it just happens that about 400 kilometers, 250 miles south of Kaohsiung, which is the major city at the southern end of Taiwan, there is an atoll uh, called Pratas in English, uh, called Tungsha in Chinese, um, that is occupied by Taiwan Marines and the Taiwan Coast Guard, uh, and that is sufficiently far from Taiwan that it doesn't pose a strategic threat to Taiwan, per se. Uh, it was never part of the treaty 
uh, area defined uh, in the earlier defense commitment to Taiwan. Uh, the PLA could probably overrun it in, in you know an hour or less, um, and it would strike a huge blow at Taiwan. I think in this period of confusion here, there's a very good chance that the United States would not react except fecklessly. So, um, and I I say inciting protests. I would note that in the last several days, um, the Chinese have been routinely conducting anti-submarine reconnaissance patrols um, and uh, electronic warfare uh, 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 sorties uh, in the area of, of the Pratis Reef. So um, I think uh, I'm not, you know, nobody can say what plans of a foreign military um, are in any immediate term. And I can't predict, but I am concerned that circumstances may have come together that facilitate a sucker blow, a sucker punch, as I put it at the outset. So that is why I thought it would be better to start thinking about what might happen and how to prevent it, um, or how to cope with it if we can't prevent it, or what we should do uh, in reaction to an event that we can't prevent now, rather than waiting for uh, January when uh, there's no sign that the confusion will have abated, uh, but we won't have anyone firmly in authority. Yes, I, might, I, uh, I, see. I, might add, I might add one other point. That is, the Taiwan Relations Act authorizes or directs that uh, the uh, United States should remain prepared to intervene uh, in a Taiwan contingency. It does not authorize such intervention. And the thesis that we're hearing more and more from people like Richard Haas, whom we quoted at the outset, John, um, is that the president should just declare we have a defense commitment to Taiwan. We don't have such a commitment, and it cannot be made constitutionally without the Congress amending the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, which I don't see any sign of them wishing to do. Uh, Chaz, could I ask you, um, Chaz, could you, el you elaborated very much, I think, on the dynamic uh, behind uh, Taipei's attitude and, and Beijing's, but the United States less so. Um, it seems to me that uh, the United States here confronts this issue of credibility. It's not looking at it just in the context of Beijing uh, Taipei and the United States, but we're an empire, a global empire. And we always come back to this saying, well, if we back down here, then who knows, all of our influence abroad will unravel. That's why we've stayed in <clears throat> to all these wars, Afghanistan, Iraq, everywhere. There's no pullout. So how much do you think that's going to be influencing the United States reaction? It's the same domino theory in Vietnam that kept us there for so long. Uh, I think these concerns about credibility are the first refuge of a scoundrel, frankly. Um, we lost in Vietnam. That doesn't seem to have impaired our credibility generally. Um, we haven't won a war since the last one I participated in, which was in 1990-91 and uh, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, we didn't know what to do with that victory, so we botched it. And the war resumed later. Um, so uh, first of all, I would I'd be very cautious about the sorts of arguments that you correctly uh, cite as driving our actions uh, in the region. Um, second, uh, I don't think the credibility issue really works terribly well in the case of Taiwan. Everybody in the region, or anybody who knows the history, which I've briefly summarized, is well aware that this is a fight between Chinese. They look to the United States not to join the fight, but to manage it and prevent it from getting out of control, which is exactly where we started in June, uh, June 27, 1950, when we put the Seventh Fleet in the Taiwan Strait. People are able to distinguish between um, the, the uh, between compromises or, uh, or setbacks that involve limited interests and those that involve what the Chinese call core interests. This is a core Chinese interest. It's not a core American interest by any standard. There is now an effort being made to describe Taiwan as, quote, the Fulda Gap, unquote, 
of East Asia. Um, I don't think any serious military strategist uh, gives this any credence at all. As uh, Bill Nitzer, I have a suggestion which flows right from what you've just said. I think the Biden team should signal to the Chinese government the following, that they will make a maximum effort to get Taiwan to voluntarily remove those Marines and other facilities from the island. And they would like the Chinese government to give them a certain period of time to accomplish that objective. And they would promise to make it clear to the Taiwanese that this is not an essential interest of the United States, and it's not even an essential interest of Taiwan, and that if the United States is to continue to support Taiwan's goals for an independent political system subject to eventual Chinese sovereignty, they are going to have to comply. Um, I think that would be an excellent first step because I think the Chinese would give us a little bit of time because it is not to their benefit to initiate the conflict which you describe. No, in fact, I think a great deal of the American uh, discussion of this issue to the extent there is any is based on a false premise, which is that the Chinese are eager to go to war over Taiwan. In fact, Chinese politics work in exactly the opposite direction. They're trying to avoid being put in a corner, so they have to go to war over, uh, over, over the Taiwan issue. Um, Bill, your suggestion is a neat way of accomplishing diplomatically what it took the Cuban Missile Crisis to accomplish with respect to Cuba. Good. That is, I'll make it happen. Um, um, but that is also a reminder of what the stakes are here. You know, here we are disputing the territorial limits of a country that regards itself as still in a civil war. Um, and that country happens to be a very powerful one, increasingly powerful. And even if you assume that uh, we get through this holiday season and period of presidentially, um, un presidential uncertainty, uh, we get through it. Um, uh, in the long run, the time is against us. I would argue that deterrence makes a lot of sense if time is on your side. And it makes no sense if time is against you. All you're doing then is bottling up a problem so that it can ferment and sometime in the future explode. Uh, I would say, uh, I would say that with regard to your suggestion, the place to start is to review the record. Uh, our most charming characteristic as Americans is our ability to forget what we've promised and what we've done. And um, review the record, to what extent are we in compliance with our undertakings to either Taipei or Beijing? Um, they know, we ought to think about that, but, and consider whether we really want to um, continue to be uh, uh, outside what we agreed or you know whether it's worth uh, continuing doing some of the things that we are doing, which aren't consistent with the promises we made. Right. Uh, okay. uh, just to finish up, if I may, what I will do tomorrow is I'm going to send an email to um, Richard Haas with a copy to Tony Blinken. I'm going to refer to you and I'm going to give them a link to your presentation. And I'm going to say, do this because it makes such obvious sense in terms of avoiding a conflict that nobody will benefit from and buying his time for a longer term diplomatic solution to this problem. Do I have your encouragement? Um, I can't stop you. <laughs> Good, okay. Um, I, my purpose in, in advancing this discussion, if it is a discussion rather than a rant, uh, is, um, uh, to cause people to think about a problem that really has not been thought enough about. We are, we have dug ourselves into a trap. How do we get out? Wow. I don't, I said, I don't see an easy exit. Um, 
Well, I think uh, there are various other people who will make comments or ask questions. So I think I think could I, could I, could I, could Sun Tzu I, is helpful. <laughs> we should follow Sun Tzu, right? Uh, could I speak? So, oh. Ralph Gomery. I am an outsider, you know, to the world of diplomacy, but. It seems to me that we had a working arrangement, the fiction that you described, right? And that, that, that we have uh, violated it. I would suggest that we return to it and do the right, the things that we said we would do, take out the military advisors, and things like that. I think that that could be tempting to the other side, to the Chinese side, because they think, and possibly correctly, the time is on their side. And so why take a chance? We'll eventually get there. We're becoming a stronger and stronger power. All right. And they believe in their future. All right. So they'll be willing to temporize and not take a chance. I think they do think that time is on their side on this issue. Um, but I think politically, it's pretty a pretty big gamble to imagine that any U.S. government at this point could do that. Well, the Trump administration, Trump administration, by launching a trade war, a technology war, and then letting that evolve into outright across the board uh, combative confrontation with China, including uh, running around the world trying to shut down Chinese businesses and prevent people from accepting Chinese foreign assistance, um, you know, has created an atmosphere here in the United States, which both parties share. Um, there is no real difference, as far as I can see, between the Democratic establishment and the Republican establishment in terms of suspicion and hospitality toward China. So I, while I'm in, I certainly have sympathy with your suggestion, um, I, I did the legal work, the legal research, which eventually became the Taiwan Relations Act, and I thought we had a pretty good thing going for four decades. Uh, but I'm not sure that we are capable of going back. Chaz, it's Paul Warren here. I'm wondering to what extent you attribute the Trump administration's misjudgment on the tariff war uh, and similarly the bullheaded foreign policy in general, because it seems to me that under the Obama administration, uh, the ambiguity that you mentioned seemed to work pretty well. Why can't uh, the Biden administration return to that? Well, I don't think it's fair to attribute all of the uh, confusion and backtracking uh, to the Trump administration. Uh, this is a process that's been going on for decades. It culminated in the Trump administration. But I don't think uh, the Obama administration or the Clinton administration uh, dealt with this very cleverly. Bill, could you turn off your, could you mute okay. your microphone? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, I, it, it, let's not blame everything on Mr. Trump. Uh, although I think it's fair to say, going to, to your starting point, uh, that there's no evidence that anybody in the Trump administration is economically literate. Um, the idea that a trade war is easy to win, um, which was the thesis uh, for starting a trade war, uh, overlooked all of the side effects of such a war, um, which we're now having to deal with. You know, basically, one of the key elements in this is Beijing's judgment. The Biden administration is likely to continue to confront China but in a clever, more effective way, because it will try to build alliances internationally to support its onslaught, that's the idea. But, um, you know, that's what they think. Now, whether that's right or not is another question. Um, uh, could we can I say something? A question about the relationship between Taiwan and what's going on with the South China Sea. Sorry, who's asking the question? Tom Mansbach. Tom Mansbach. Okay. And the question, the question is, what do you see as the relationship between what's going on with Taiwan on the one hand, Chinese adventurism in the South China Sea? 
Um, there's not much um, connection between the two in my mind. Um, uh, the, certainly the Chinese are in a mood um, quite different from the one they were in for years, which was a rather passive willingness to accept what they regarded as provocations. They're now quite assertive, and sometimes uh, self-destructively so, as they're showing with Australia at the moment. Um, uh, and um, uh, the South China Sea uh, is um, basically was a no man's land. It was claimed by China at least as early as 1914. And um, the Vietnamese picked up a French claim in the 1930s. Um, the Philippines launched a claim in the 1950s. Malaysia formulated one in the 1970s. In the 1980s, under the impact of the Law of the Sea Treaty, uh, all of those countries, um, uh, that is the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, now United, and uh, Malaysia, uh, began to occupy and fortify facilities in the South China Sea. The Chinese uh, didn't do much of anything until 1987, 88, uh, when they reacted militarily and drove, uh, killed a lot of Vietnamese on the reef. Um, in order to establish their own presence. Um, and they have since, of course, taken that presence, which was restricted to the least desirable features in the area because they were the last in there, and improved those uh, features by putting in large islands. There are many factors related to why they're doing that. Uh, one is a simple uh, analogy from the game of Weichi or Go in Japanese. Uh, which is a game of encirclement, uh, where you break the enemy's strategy by putting down pieces on the board that prevent encirclement. Um, this is a strategy that derives from Weichi or Go, in a sense. Second, uh, the South China Sea is where the British, French, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, and all the other Europeans invaded China, and it's seen as an essential defense perimeter for the country. So by putting these uh, fortifications on, on uh, artificial islands, the Chinese have expanded their defense uh, perimeter. They can monitor submarine and other actions in the region. Uh, they have a limited air defense capability, uh, but these are basically pickets in the military sense out in front uh, meant to fend off uh, an attack. Um, the third element is that the United States has been um, very openly provocative, deliberately so, uh, with freedom of navigation patrols through the South China Sea, uh, which challenge um, the way that the Chinese draw baselines around the, around the features they control, and also challenge their thesis that they have historical rights to the region, which is legally probably nonsense. So um, the naval confrontation there, um, and the ironic thing, of course, is that we pretend to be, uh, we say we're defending freedom of navigation. In fact, the navigation from South China Sea is two thirds Chinese going to or from China. And the purpose of the US Navy being there is to set ourselves up to interdict or interrupt that commerce in the event of a Taiwan contingency. So that's the connection. Um, and uh, I just leave it there. It's uh, very complicated and it's not, uh, not well uh, explained in our press and media, I don't think. Um, Ed I Lutra, I had a question or comment maybe. Yeah, Ed, go ahead. Our former salon speaker, Ed Ludbeck. Uh, Ed, I think you're I think you're muted. He's muted. He's muted. <laughs> Can you unmute yourself, Ed? <laughs> oh, well, I guess not. I see Clyde <laughs> with it. A... I'm mute now. Yeah. Can oh, you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, I just like to make very few analytical points. First, um, any explanation of what's happened to U.S.-China relations in the last four years, uh, which uh, relates it to any U.S. action, must be wrong because the same identical trajectory 
was followed in China-India relations. If you recall, the PM, not only PM Singh, but Modi had 12 meetings with, with Xi Jinping. PM Singh went to Beijing and celebrated with Xi Jinping. The trajectory is the same. The trajectory with countries like Australia and Canada is the same. The trajectory with Sweden. By some weird chance, I was in the Swedish embassy in 1980 or 81, when Sweden was the very first country to start cultural relations, state-level cultural relations with China. And this year, they've stopped all of them. They've stopped and shut down everything. So given the same trajectories with very different countries that have very different priorities, the change cannot be attributed to the U.S. side without going through a very elaborate analytical argument. People just say, oh, Trump is crazy, therefore, therefore. But, but I don't believe the Swedish government is crazy, nor the, given the, what happened in India relations with China. Going exactly the same trajectory. It begins with maximum goodwill and ends with border incidents. Now, second analytical point. I think that an argument could be made that the most single important factor in uh, other than avoiding nuclear Armageddon, uh, given that, uh, in dealing with Taiwan is the impact on Japan. Because Japan, unlike other countries, has choices. They can, they can go or not go nuclear. They can stay on the U.S. side or they can go neutralist. They can go pro-China. If the United States uh, is seen as unable to protect Taiwan, that will have a huge impact in Japanese politics. Now, I don't believe that statement can be contradicted. What can be co argued with is the nature of the impact, the magnitude of it. Third point, one aspect of U.S. policy towards Taiwan has been highly questionable for a very long time, and that is the practice of selling weapons to Taiwan. Given the, the idea of selling weapons to make money is a good one. It's a major U.S. export. However, when you have a country like Taiwan, which you have a commitment to defend, like a country like Israel, you have a commitment to defend. If you have a commitment to defend Israel and Israelis spend their entire defense budget on ice cream, the United States has grants to complain, saying, look, we are committed to protect you, and here you are spending your defense budget on ice cream. <laughs> but we have not only allowed, but have affected the Taiwanese spending their money, their defense budget on ice cream, because battle tanks are ice cream, frigates are ice cream, aeroplanes, expensive aeroplanes for which you do not build shelters. In fact, the only Taiwan air base which has shelters, and they're not good ones, is Hualien Base in South right. Taiwan. Now, so this has been a real culpability. I noticed in the very last arms package, for the first time, there was a relevant piece of equipment. It, for the first time, they, were, they bought anti-ship missiles, which are truck-mounted, not to be sank ship-mounted, but truck mounted that you can press around the island. This is such an exception, quite shocking. So in that regard, we have been completely irresponsible, irresponsible. And but in regard to the the context, which is the broad context, US relations context, I don't actually believe that US did anything. Because for example, the discovery that the Chinese are very dependent on US microprocessors. The desire to use this to cripple the Chinese industry insofar as one can. This followed, followed, did not proceed, the discovery made that the technological, the amount of technological theft that was taking place was not what the French have been doing or anybody else has been doing, but it's been on a gigantic scale, down to hiring, hiring. Harvard professors to hand over to them what are in fact billions of dollars technologies for $50,000 a month. 
So that was the response. You see, you attack us technologically, we are going to counterattack technologically. But apart from the overall mood factor, you, is absolutely irrelevant because, as I say, identical trajectories were followed by countries that started in a very different mood and never did any of the things Trump did. So, the point, final point, specifically impact on Japan or whatever we do in regard to Taiwan. So, uh, and, uh, yeah, so could I, could I um, make a remark? Um, although I'm quite um, ignorant of diplomatic things, I do not, I'm not ignorant of economic and technological things, right? And um, there is in this country um, a great deal of corporate support for good relations with China, including all sorts of manufacturing transfers and so forth. And that wish to do that has aided China enormously and the companies still want to do it. So there is a great deal of support and this support is backed by company money and company money has an influence in politics. So there is a real possibility that the changes back towards the sort of thing that we were doing are politically possible because corporations will often want them. That is a, that is a very help, uh, hopeful note on which to um, uh, begin uh, very briefly, I, I, I will try to be very brief, uh, to disagree with that on a number of issues. Um, um, first, uh, I don't think the fact that the um, relations with India in particular have deteriorated uh, uh, as ours have deteriorated with China um, is, uh, is indicative of a, a particular trend on the part of China. Uh, we don't have a border with China. Uh, India doesn't have a settled border with China, uh, but the Indian government has been fortifying that border and in many ways, in my view, returning to this sort of posture on the border that brought about the 1962 Sino-Indian border war. Um, uh, Australia is a different factor. Uh, I would be the last one to argue that Chinese behavior has been benign or wise in either context, um, or, or to say that there was no element of Chinese culpability in the deterioration of relations with the United States, but I don't think we can overlook uh, the factors that I mentioned, um, culminating in an across-the-board on, uh, onslaught on China by the United States. Second, with respect to Japan, which I think is really key, um, First of all, I would just say that the Japanese are well aware that Taiwan has not done what it needs to do to defend itself uh, and has relied on the United States. And it's also aware that the ability of the United States to defend Taiwan has been steadily declining. Uh, so this is not news. Um, the Japanese are, in fact, repositioning themselves strategically in response to this and other developments in the region. Third, on arms sales to Taiwan, um, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, Taiwan has chosen to treat arms purchases as tokens of political affection rather than as part of some systematic and sensible defense policy. Um, I would just note that many, many decades ago, when the United States um, agreed to limit and then eventually phase down uh, our weapon sales to Taiwan, uh, we encouraged Taiwan to do what the Swedes have done. Namely, this is the Taiwan is larger than Sweden. And that is uh, to uh, accept technology transfers and, and, and put their uh, budget into their own production. Uh, they've not done so. Um, on the question of uh, our efforts to cripple Chinese technology, uh, I'll make two comments. First is that uh, Every rising country, scientifically and technologically, including the United States in the 19th century, has been contemptuous of other people's intellectual property rights and has made free with them. It wasn't until 1898 when we became an ex exporter 
of intellectual property that we got religion on the subject. Japan in the 20th century, for much of it, was in a similar position. China uh, has been in that position in recent years. But just as in our case and in the Japanese case, uh, this is self-correcting. As countries become domestically innovative, their own people demand intellectual property protection. And this has very much happened in China. Uh, so it's not an argument for not pushing the Chinese. We should have done so intelligently, uh, but we did so unintelligibly, which is my, unintelligently, which is my second point. And that is that by going after Chinese imports of semiconductors, and more recently, just I think yesterday, um, elements of the electrical power grid, uh, we are not only depriving ourselves of our largest market, uh, but we are basically undermining the market dominance that we ourselves have uh, exercised in these domains. We have guaranteed the rise of a competitor. Uh, this is nothing new. 1973, President Nixon embargoed soybean exports, and the result was entirely predictable. Uh, the Japanese, who were the major importer, invested in Brazil and on the China mainland, um, and became our biggest, com those areas became our big competitors. So um, I, uh, I think finally on the issue of Japan, just to go back to that, in the United States, um, the initial Chinese proposal for negotiation with Taiwan addressed the question of the strategic implications of Taiwan being part of a broader China. It did so in several ways, one of which was to promise not only that there would be no members of the PLA stationed on Taiwan, but that Taiwan would retain its own armed forces to defend that part of China against foreigners. That at least is the, the diplomatic fiction. Um, the purpose of this, and I discussed the formulation with its author at the time, the purpose of this was to reassure the United States and Japan that the reunification of Taiwan with the mainland would not threaten them strategically. Japan is indeed very conscious of the strategic importance of Taiwan in terms of two things. First, it was a bridge for the Dutch and others to shoot their way into treaty ports in Japan in the beginning. Commodore Perry was there before he went to Tokyo. Uh, it is second, uh, it was the launching platform, had the Japanese considered it was their term, uh, an unsinkable aircraft carrier. MacArthur later borrowed that from them. Um, it was their launching point for the attacks on the Philippines, on Indochina and Hong Kong, uh, coincident with Pearl Harbor. So it has, uh, for Japan, a speci special uh, significance, yes. Um, in the hands of some of a hostile power, um, it is a problem for Japan. In the hands of Japan, it has been a catastrophe for all of its neighbors. Um, and uh, when the United States agreed in World War II to return the island to Taiwan, the State Department made the most eloquent argument I've ever seen for why this was necessary, because they said, if you imagine an island 100 miles off the coast of North Carolina uh, with uh, the, the size of, of, of Maryland, um, from that island, you could control the entire coast of the United States from Florida to Maine. Um, it would be a strategic disaster for the United States if such a situation were to emerge. And it's no less a disaster for China uh, for that situation to emerge. So with all due respect, Ed, um, I don't accept your thesis that um, it's not uh, in part or in large measure our fault that our relations with China have uh, retrogressed. I think the Japan factor, I agree with you, is very important, but I don't think it's more, it's as much of a shock to the Japanese potentially were we to adjust our relations with Taiwan as suggested earlier. I don't think, I think the issue of temp people taking a free ride on American protection is not limited to Taiwan, unfortunately. Mm. And finally, I'm deeply disturbed by the economic reasoning that is giving away American market dominance in a, an increasing number of areas by cutting off trade with our largest market. 
Chance, it's Barry Wood. Hey. Could I ask you about um, the tougher Chinese stance in Hong Kong? What are the implications of that for China, Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the implications are clear in one sense. Um, the agreement with the British on Hong Kong was one China, two systems. The demonstrators in Taiwan were not t defending two systems. They were taking issue with one China. They were um, burning the flag. They were um, uh, mooning uh, the Chinese national anthem when it was played. Uh, they were demanding independence. And they actually created a situation which brought on the inevitable response. I think it's a tragedy. Taiwan looks at this and sees um, the, the vulnerability it would face if it were to agree to a parallel um, situation. Of course, what was on offer, I don't know if it still is, was not a parallel situation because it assumed that Taiwan would retain its own armed forces and not have a Chinese garrison on its territory and that it would retain its existing indigenous uh, democracy. Uh, Hong Kong's never had a democracy. The British never thought anything about putting democracy in there during the 150 years or so that they were there. Um, Mr. Patton, the governor at the time of the handover, um, suddenly discovered the merits of democracy. And by doing what he did, he basically broke the understanding with that had been reached in Beijing between the Chinese and the British ambassador, in which the Chinese were going to make a gift of democracy to Hong Kong. He tried to give it, tried to make it a British gift. Um, that had a, has a lot to do with why things have gone so badly wrong. By the way, I don't think Hong Kong was finished as an economic entrepot or financial center, although it's going to be very different. And um, uh, it's still going to be a very free society economically, but politically it's going to be repressed. And I think that is truly tragic. Yes, I'm glad here. Um, what are the minimum terms that you think? I mean, she also runs some risks here. Um, so, and, and we, in principle, at least we all agree there's one China. But what exactly does she want? Uh, um, he, he's shown in Hong Kong that he's not, he's not willing to allow free speech in Hong Kong. Uh, or it seems that way. At least. So is that the same? You know, what, would he need to have a Taiwan that's now like Hong Kong or something less? Um, I don't think, I think the conditions are quite different and the offers are quite different. And until the negotiation occurs, you can't tell um, what, what might emerge from it. Um, uh, Hong Kong didn't negotiate with China. Uh, the British did. Um, so uh, Taipei is full of very clever people. Um, uh, who are good negotiators, and um, uh, I think we ought to be encouraging them to try uh, to find a basis for peaceful coexistence with the mainland on whatever terms uh, they can 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 reach, and we should be supportive of them in any such negotiation. But for she, uh, what, what's, wrong with, thing, what's wrong with the existing terms? What's wrong with the existing terms are that we have undercut every promise we made. Taipei has decided it wants to be independent, but can't be independent. Um, it knows it can't be independent, and it's counting on us to make it independent. You know, Tsai Ing-wen, who was the president in Taipei, was a very cautious, prudent uh, woman, is a committed independence advocate. Taipei's representative in Washington, B. Kim Xiao, is similarly identified with the extreme element in the so-called deep green part of the Democratic, uh, the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party in, in Taiwan. Right. No, right. so the, the, Beijing does not accept the status quo in Taiwan. It never has. It has, all it has done is said that it would do its damnedest to solve the problem of the relationship of Taiwan to the mainland by peaceful means. The use of peaceful means is no longer very credible. I'm not sure it has any credibility at all. And I'm seeing commentary out of Beijing um, by people who say it has none. 
Uh, so we have undermined, you know, deterrence depends on reassurance as well. Okay, let's, let's assume that, dream. let's accept that, we've, that we're at fault. Let's, so let's suppose Biden says, okay, you're right, Jazz, we're going to go back to uh, Nixon and, and to the three 1979, 82 stages. But, but so that leaves Taiwan uh, as it is to deal with Beijing. And Taiwan, as it is, doesn't pose a threat to Beijing or to China. No, that's not true. That is not true. Okay. Politically, this is the most explosive issue in Chinese politics. And one thing Mr. Xi Jinping cares about, probably more than anything, is staying in power. This is the one issue that could throw the Communist Party out of power. And by the way, if there were a democracy in Beijing, they would be even tougher on this issue uh, than the very restrained, cautious, cynical leadership that now, now, now presides. So this is not, it is not the case that this is not a problem. This is a serious problem. And by appearing to back Taiwan separation from the mainland, which we have done quite egregiously in recent days, we have brought this problem to a head. Shaz, can you uh, mention uh, earlier about uh, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and to follow up on Clyde, um, with um, the effort that the uh, Soviets had made to plant uh, missiles uh, in Cuba, and Cuba 95, 90 miles off the coast of the United States, uh, we obviously were willing to go to the edge of war, brinkmanship, uh, because of that threat. How would you compare that Soviet threat being in Cuba and its relation to our national security with our current posture on Taiwan and the Chinese looking at Taiwan as the same level of security risk to itself as we viewed Cuba and the Soviet Union in the Cuban Missile Crisis? Well, there are parallels in the sense that neither Cuba nor Taiwan can have peace and prosperity without a good relationship with the mainland. Uh, it confronts us in the case of Cuba, China in the case of Taiwan. Um, we have not put missiles in Taiwan, uh, not our own anyway. Um, and we did pledge to uh, assist Taiwan's defense, not to give it an offensive capability. So there really isn't a parallel with the Soviet actions in Cuba yet. But if you look at the foreign issue of foreign affairs today, you will find an advocacy of putting uh, intermediate nuclear forces in Taiwan. Um, it is being advocated now by uh, those in the, uh, in the ranks of the anti-China uh, militarily inclined in the United States. It's being proposed as a site uh, from which to um, base missiles directed at China, at the mainland. And I, I think it's very important to realize that no war that occurs in the Taiwan area can avoid U.S. strikes on targets on the mainland. It's not possible to deal with the PLA Air Force or Navy or rocket forces without attacking the, their bases on the mainland. And Chinese military doctrine is very clear. In the event that they are attacked, they counterattack. In the event that they are attacked, they attack the rear of those who are attacking them. That is the continental United States. So this is not a simple issue. And anybody who imagines that, you know, we can just walk in there and defeat this army that once, once it was a junkyard army. And people used to joke about an attack on Taiwan involving the million men swim, but this is not with their current, current situation. So I'm just arguing, I'm not arguing for any particular position. I think we would be better off if we were able to restore the past, but I don't think we can for all the political reasons that have, I've, I've mentioned and others have mentioned. I would like to think that the American corporate community, which has been silent in the face of security arguments, as it usually is, um, might advocate restoration of some sort of reasonable relationship with China. 
any relationship with China is going to, from now on, however, is going to have to deal with the residue of out outright hostility that has been established. We can't start yes. again where we were. We are back to the 1950s in terms of U.S.-China relations. Hey, Chaz. I'm going to make a point here. Uh, so one thing I haven't heard much of, although you have alluded to it quite a bit, and Bruce mentioned U.S. imperialism. And that is, uh, and I'm not a diplomat, but I am a historian, and uh, I've got family ties going back to the Pacific, back to the Boxer Rebellion, uh, Japanese uh, war on uh, the Philippines. So I've had to pay attention to this through my lifetime. And, uh, but you don't need to go back that far to history. I am and have been on active duty most of the last three or four decades, paying attention to what the United States has been doing ever since Cheney declared his Cheney doctrine. I suppose, you know, I'm not that intelligent, so I'm, I'm going to guess the Chinese have paid a bit of attention to this as well. And the point being is they've read our doctrine. We, they've read our aggressiveness. I remember reading where China and Russia, Brazil and uh, uh, India and South Africa were coming together in the early 2000s because they saw the U.S. was uh, painting a target on all of them economically and as well as militarily because we say so. They don't have to guess. We tell them so. So I haven't heard enough talk conversation about that, in my opinion, of what a country does, and Hannah Arendt always taught, you have to look through others' eyes. What does a country do? What did we do after 9-11? We immediately clamped down on our own population a variety of ways, just like China's done. Uh, we have become more authoritarian ourselves. Long before Trump came along, we only, you know, his predecessors paved the way. What we haven't mentioned was uh, Obama going to Japan and talking with the revanchist uh, Abe on revoking the peace constitution and actively helping him subvert it, which is widely reported back about 10 years ago. Uh, anyway, I could go on, but nobody's paying attention to, or has really mentioned sufficiently, in my opinion, U.S. aggression uh, under the doctrine that we have hegemony over the entire world, and anybody who resists that in any way becomes the enemy to be targeted. So perhaps you can discuss that a bit. Well, I think um, the essential um, objective of the United States um, in East Asia has boiled down to the maintenance of the primacy, the strategic primacy, the geopolitical primacy that our victory in World War II gave us. Uh, the Japanese expelled the European imperialists, for they then had their day as an imperial power, um, and we destroyed them and filled the vacuum that that created. That vacuum doesn't exist anymore. Um, countries of East Asia are strong, wealthy. Um, Japan itself has formidable armed forces, although it doesn't call them such because it is constitutionally barred from doing what it is actually doing. Um, so I, I think our whole policy in East Asia needs to be adjusted, um, as Ed said in the case of Taiwan, maybe to support greater defense efforts by those we are protecting, uh, to reduce our own exposure, um, to reduce the use of military means in favor of more diplomacy and trade and commerce, investment. Um, in other words, I basically agree with the thesis of the newly established Quincy Institute that we need a restrained foreign policy. Um, and I think that applies in the case of Taiwan as well as to other cases. But um, that's a whole other subject, Todd, that um, we, 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 we bat around on the salon list quite a bit. Um, so I'll just leave it where it is tonight. Hey, Chaz, uh, I just have a quick question. Uh, it seems to me that the economic consequences of a, a, an attack by China on Taiwan would be catastrophic. And that in it, of itself would be a deterrent. Uh, that's my fir first question. The second thing is, why couldn't we use economics as a deterrent. That is, we uh, basically tell the Chinese and so, you know, in one form or another that if you do this, the economic consequences to you will be catastrophic. I mean, it, it may be without, without any sort of messaging, but that may be part of the policy is that you make explicit the economic consequences of, of invading uh, Taiwan. Anyway, I, I would be curious to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I don't think, as I said uh, earlier, that what we're talking about in any reasonable time frame 
uh, is an invasion of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese um, are very cautious. They plan carefully. I don't think they think they're ready for that. They could do it. But I think they'd prefer more time to prepare. So and they don't want to have to do it. Um, you know, interestingly, I wrote a book called Arts of Power, Statecraft and Diplomacy. Um, Chinese general who was in charge of planning Taiwan operations, read it, had it translated into Chinese. Why? Because of a section in it which talked about why occupying other countries or societies was inherently problematic. Um, it corrodes the readiness of the force that's occupying. It corrupts them. It puts them into police work, which they're unfit for. Um, and it arouses opposition rather than pacifies it. And he applied that to Taiwan. He said, we absolutely don't want to get into the business of occupying Taiwan. There would be a nasty, that would be a nasty situation. What they do want to do is negotiate a solution. Now, with respect to the economic, uh, economics of the thing, we've already done a good deal of what you suggest. You know, we have forced... Taiwan Semiconductor, which is the major fabricator of semiconductors in the world, the most advanced, to cut off its market on the mainland. Um, we have forced other companies in Taiwan, which had been heavily engaged in uh, collaboration with mainland companies, to sever those relationships. Um, so we have been trying to start a trade embargo go between Taiwan and the mainland that hasn't really succeeded because the two are very interdependent now and probably will continue to be. Um, the mainland is, China, is Taiwan's major market and um, from the mainland point of view, Taiwan's an important market, but it's marginal, which may, brings me to the last point. Norman Angel, notwithstanding, countries do go to war even when the consequences, economic consequences are terrible. Um, secure, national security issues, pride, uh, and hubris uh, overcome economic calculations. Sometimes you do stuff you just feel you have to do, which is why Abraham Lincoln did not accept the advice of the many people around him not to go to war with the South. Um, it was economically ruinous to go to war, but he did it. And um, in the end, it worked out okay for him. Um, very often, it doesn't work out okay. If I can just dive in for a quick moment. Uh, my understanding, I, I have not been in Taiwan in about six months, uh, but my understanding is that uh, the younger Chinese, uh, sorry, Taiwanese business folks see their future China, and that they are uh, pushing for a closer relationship for business purposes. I don't know what the strength of the younger Taiwanese business community is in the body politic of uh, Taiwan. And perhaps you can sort of unravel that a little bit for me. Well, uh, the upper generation in Taiwan, which is uh, pretty much mutually assimilated, that is the descendants of Chiang Kai-shek's um, people who came over and the indigenous Chinese who had experienced uh, Japanese efforts of assimilation have intermarried and uh, become really one, one people. Um, um, there are over a million of them living and working on the mainland. As I indicated, uh, travel connections have been intensive. Um, these younger people have grown up with a situation in which there was peace in the Taiwan Strait, and uh, this was good for Taiwan economically. It's part of the reason that Taiwan has succeeded as well as it has. But I don't think one could dis one should discount the emotion, emotional strength of identity politics. Certainly no American having experienced what we've just experienced would want to do so, I think. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the future will bring in terms of attitudes. Uh, but I've noted in the course of, uh, you know, I, I learned Taiwanese when I was on Taiwan, never used it, so I 
professionally, so I've basically forgotten it. But my original objective was not to go with Nixon to China, as I did, but to, but to serve in the embassy in Taipei, uh, where I could use my Taiwanese language skills. Um, I think I know something about attitudes on the island, and uh, I'm not sure where they will end up. Uh, the mainland has done a lot of things right. Uh, I'll name one, one interesting example of a sophisticated policy. Uh, I used to go visit the Taiwan Affairs Office in Beijing uh, when I would be in China. And um, they had on the first floor of their building, they had a bulletin board uh, with um, kind of an outlay of uh, what function was on what floor. And, and I'd always look at that. It's, it was in Chinese, of course. I'd look at it and read it before I went up to the fourth floor or whatever it was to, to meet the big boss. And one time I was going there and I saw cosmetic surgery department. And I thought, what in God's name is that? So I asked. And the, the, my interlocutor said, you know, it's funny you should ask. Um, he said, we did a survey polling in Taiwan. We discovered that the two groups most opposed to reunification were lawyers and cosmetic surgeons. So we've opened a licensing department to give cosmetic surgeons in Taiwan the ability to practice on the mainland. And you'd be amazed how they've changed their attitude. So I think um, uh, we're dealing with a situation <laughs> that it's a civil war situation. The two intelligence services, um, which parallel each other, have actually had exchanges between their analysts. You know, this is not Russia versus or the Soviet Union versus the United States. It's something very different. Uh, so I, I, I don't know what the future will bring. I think there is confusion in Taiwan. I think Chinese are very pragmatic. And people in Taiwan, if they know that they have to make a choice, will reluctantly do so. Uh, so that's the you know, best answer I can give. We seem to be running out of time. Well, Chaz, we appreciate uh, uh, this talk, and I, I think everyone is glad that we, we did it now. And let's hope that your uh, your instincts are turn out to be wrong, and that uh, it isn't as it doesn't uh, materialize uh, during this transition period. But uh, uh, thanks again for for everything and being who you are. You're a very special person, and we committee is uh, indebted to you and. Uh, we look forward to uh, uh, the, this madness passing and, and uh, having a chance to give you our Defender of Liberty Award. Um, I will say in Chinese, pizza, pizza, meaning the feeling is entirely mutual. And I'll thank you, John, for your thank contributions. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, Chaz. Right. Thank you, Chaz. Thank you, Chaz. Excellent. Great job, Chaz. Third of force.